Thank you, Federica, Max, and Fadi to, uh, for inviting me. And yeah, it's a bit ironic that uh, same, same, but different. I gave this presentation, I have to admit, once before. So it is same, same, trying to make it a little bit different. Um, so, and the difference will be right at the beginning because you guys challenged me to, uh, here we go. Uh, so, um, well, Federico already talked about where I've been hanging around on this planet, so we already have that. But you guys challenged me to think about robots in uh, the COVID crisis. And I have to admit that I'm utterly incompetent on this topic. Uh, I, I don't really know much about this. Um, and I've said, I know that some of you already actually have done some studies on this and how robots have been used. But anyway, uh, it comes along or it ties nicely into my talk because this is just another example of where you have a robot who's got a thermometer in his hand or its hand and uh, is supposed to be um, the solution to a problem. And um, I have to admit, when I start thinking about it, this is not the solution. Um, because if you put the robot at the airport to prevent people with COVID to enter your country, then this doesn't work because there are so many people who are asthmatic. So they don't have, they don't have any signs or signals or symptoms of the illness. And therefore just taking their temperature doesn't really prevent them from entering. So if you want to do it properly, you kind of have to do what New Zealand is doing. It's like everybody who comes to New Zealand has to go into a two week quarantine and you get regular checks and you are locked up in a hotel room and you can't see and talk to anybody. And that is how you filter and prevent um, people from coming into the country with the illness. And as a result, New Zealand is COVID free. So I've got the privilege of roaming around in New Zealand just wherever and whenever I, I want. And I, just came back from the swimming pool and uh, yeah, it's all, everything is operational and everything is COVID free. So this, this works, but the robots play absolutely no role in this. Um, and then you might think, okay, well, but the idea is good, isn't it? It's like you put a robot in harm's way so that humans don't get harmed. Well, the issue is if you have actually somebody with a higher temperature, then this robot will be unable to deal with it. A robot cannot um, process such a human being. So uh, it will then be up to a human to interview the person, do further tests. So it doesn't prevent any interaction that follows. So in that sense, it doesn't really help. And also for every robot you deploy, you need to have a couple of engineers and software people in the background maintaining the robot so you actually add people to the risk uh, while maybe removing one person who is usually just holding uh, the thermometer. And then again, do you actually need a robot for this? Could you not just have a thermometer? And I've been, I used to travel around the globe and it has been common practice to just have a thermometer on a, on a tripod recording people that, you know, entered the airport and it has been working for years. So all of this in a way looks to me again, as a symptom of where we have the solution. And now we're looking for a problem to solve. And so, okay, we're all in robotics and we have our robots. And here we are, we can say, okay, look, we contribute. Now we're helping the COVID crisis. And I'm not sure that we really do. And this is a symptomatic problem that we have that is in a way inhibiting us from making any real progress. So this is as much, well, maybe I come back a bit to the COVID crisis uh, every once in a while, but this is sort of setting the scene here a little bit. We all know that um, uh, robots are quite popular um, and there, there's something about it. Uh, so here is uh, the robot building in Bangkok, Thailand, which was created by the Bank of Asia and it's his headquarters. So they built a whole building to look like a robot and it's a bank. Why would they do that? Uh, of course, robots symbolize something. They symbolize the future and technology. And this bank thought that this is the image that they need to project. So they built a whole building to look like a robot. Um, and it just says how strong the ideas in our society about robots. 
And of course, there are plenty of plenty of robots in the media. Um, and, and here is uh, a nice little image that you can look and if anybody ever finds Wally -E in this image, please let me know because I'm still struggling to identify him. Um, but this indeed shows a, a lot of different robots that have been shown in the media. But it's not just the media because when we did our little book on human robot interaction, we did a lot of effort into finding nice images and photographs of all the social robots that we've been working with or that we saw or that our colleagues built. And as part of it, we also created a timeline of all these robots about when they all uh, happened. So here you see, for example, in around 2000, Honda produced uh, Asimo. And the interesting thing here is that they stopped in 2018. And this is a pattern that emerged. Most, if not all of the robots in the book have been discontinued. And now and Pepper are in the book. And my prediction for 2021 will be that SoftBank Robotics will start producing now and Peppa. Maybe I'm wrong, but I really worry about it's going to happen. And so the question is, why is that? Why, why do all the robots that we build and bring into the market stop and being discontinued? Literally all of them. I mean, if this is the case, that whenever we try to bring it to the market, it fails, then maybe something is wrong. Maybe something is wrong with what we do or how we do things. There's, there's, there is a potential for, for real disaster here. So why don't we have a look at an example? Um, this is, of course, the Jibo robot, which, which you might uh, remember. And Jibo was uh, created uh, by Cynthia Brazel, and she originally started an Indiegogo funding campaign, and they collected around 3 million US dollars. And then you add another $60 million on venture capital to it, and then you get Jibo. And here you've got Cynthia uh, introducing the robot. So I'll try to play the video. Jibo, please introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, this is actually, uh, we have we developed uh, several prototypes on the road to where we are right now. And certainly um, we've done testing all along the way. You know, we very quickly found, and if this is just reinforces a lot of what I found uh, as my work at, at, at MIT, people want to treat Jibo like a someone, not a something. And they often, at the end of the interaction, would say, we'd ask them explicitly, what's the difference between Jibo and, and a tablet computer? And they, you know, they used, they owned and had tablet computers. And they said, well, Jibo, Jibo fits in my family. Jibo's part of the family. You know, Jibo's warm, Jibo's friendly. Um, Jibo's like, all right, you heard that, right? Jibo is not just a tablet computer. It is a someone, is warm, fits into the family, right? Sounds like a good story. So we have the leading people in robotics. We've got more than $60 million. Um, they made it to the Time Magazine cover. Uh, they had a major exposure in the media. They did everything right by the book. I mean, you could not do it any better than what they have done. And uh, this is then how it was received. In July 2014, men did not yet know the dangers of backing just any random Kickstarter or And swimming in childlike naivety and blind optimism, over 2,500 people backed Jibo a social robot companion that the creators, Jibo Inc., promised would do everything from making video calls to reading bedtime stories. And this was long before the Google Assistant or Amazon Echo existed. Now, for my part, it was pretty obvious that Jibo was too ambitious to be anything but an enormous belly flop onto a bed of hot coals. But coming off of the success of my then recent flaying of the Brunton hydrogen reactor, I was looking for a way to up the ante. I was looking for something even dumber to roast. So I bought one. Three and a half years later, my very own Jibo finally showed up. Was it worth the wait? Was it worth 900 US dollars? Of course not. Don't be a Jibo. 
This video was brought to you. And uh, yeah, so the reception wasn't particularly good by the media. And then around 2019, the company went bust and it stopped. Um, Jibo was done for. And uh, this is, of course, sad. Quite a few of us may, might have bought one of these. And uh, yeah, so they did everything right. They even managed to bring it to the market. So it's not like they had so many other crowdsourcing or crowdfunding campaigns where they promised a product and they never built it. No, they actually brought it to the market. And that was a real achievement. And it didn't work. Well, to be precise, in 2020, NTT Disruption bought Jibo. Uh, so it was already dead. You know, the company was gone and NTT Disruption decided to buy it. Now, you probably all know NTT, the Japanese telecommunications company. They started a new division called Disruption because they are disruptive or they want to be disruptive. And just to give you an, a flavor of what entity disruption is about, I uh, can show you the promotion video, uh, the mission statement, so to speak, uh, that they have. Spirit, what a word. To you, there's no till where, no till here. Impossible, unthinkable, crazy thing. All those words you deal with every day. Shut you in, they set you free. You, the old rules breaker, you, the new. You don't live in the real world, some may say. This world of theirs is changing. So, people like you, change is happening. People who see things differently. To say no to no. You are just a few, some may say. Yes, we are. Yeah, so every time I watch this video, um, this is all stock video, right? So this is all video clips that you can buy off the internet um, and you just make a nice script script to it and get an engaging speaker and this is it and this is part of the problem uh Jibo has become a marketing gag uh, and it fits into this big message of marketing disruption innovation but with not much substance and this is where it comes in when i say same same but different they built Jibo, they brought it to the market and failed then NTT comes in and says, oh yeah, we're going to do the same thing, but when we do it, it's going to be different. And I interviewed them. I actually, I asked them, you know, I, I did a podcast episode on why do all social robots fail? And I interviewed NTT and I asked them, well, what's, what's going to happen? And what are you going to do differently? What is going to be the difference now? And they say, well, well, we're going to do, you know, healthcare and education. But that is what exactly what GWO was trying to do already. I mean, this was the market that they were also targeting. So it is same, same, but different. And we always believe that when we do it, it's going to be different or we are not going to be the one who is going to fail. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you even think about not just Jibo, but others, uh, let's take um, uh, Pepper. Pepper was originally um, brought to the market by Alde, by, it was built by Aldebaran Robotics and they were bought up by SoftBank. SoftBank was and is a big investment company, but also it started off in Japan as a big telecommunications company. And essentially they had all these uh, shops where they sell phones. And the first thing they do is that they put Papa into all of their stores. It's a marketing stunt. Right? Yeah, I mean, this is what sets it apart. They can put this into, the, into their shops and then people come in and, and interact with it. Um, so it's predominantly driven by, it's a marketing gag and that, that's pretty much it. And yes, yeah, we get to buy these robots as well and do some other research with it. But the way it came to the life was uh, as for marketing purposes. And, and you see, they've got a touch pad uh, on their chest. Why is that? I mean, that's crazy. And of course, the reason is that speech recognition and these noisy, noisy shops don't work. You can't actually talk to the robot. 
you actually have to use the touchpad to interact with it because speech recognition doesn't work. But then the point is, well, if you're using a touchpad, could you not just have a kiosk there? Wouldn't that do the exact same thing? And from a functional perspective, probably yes. I mean, a kiosk would just do the exact same thing and you don't actually need it to be a robot. So why do you want it to be a robot? Well, you want it to be a robot because it's better marketing. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So same, same, but different. Let's take another example. The Christchurch airport, so the airport here in Christchurch, they bought three Pepper robots and they want to use them for the airport. And it's the same story again. They bought it and then they couldn't actually do anything with it. Um, so some studies, I mean, some kind of little interactions were produced and a lot of marketing went into it. A lot of media coverage was generated but nothing substantial came from it. Um, it can even, so this might be a bit problematic. And, and, and one of the reasons of course, is that Pepper raises so high expectations because of, of its human shape. And, and Sony was much smarter with their dog robots because their the expectations is much lower. You don't expect it to understand you or to speak back because dogs don't do that. And so a robotic dog wouldn't do either. So that's a much smarter way of approaching it. And, you know, you can even bring it down to uh, the, the power of the seal, which just purrs and wiggles and that's it. I mean, you can touch it, but that's it. I mean, this is the level on which social interaction works for some, for a very, very small group and special people, uh, people, for example, with, with Alzheimer and dementia, um, you know, they've seen to be respond reasonably well to this. Uh, but again, this is uh, a very specific market that does exist, um, but it is not the general social robot that works. So on the other hand, we, of course, we've got functional robots, like we have floor cleaning robots and we have other robots, particularly in industry, right? We've got a lot of production robots and, it, and, and they work and people buy it and they stay. Social robots don't have a function. They don't actually do or help us with anything. Well, yes, maybe in socializing, companionship, maybe, um, but they don't actually, cannot, they cannot actually do anything. The pepper robot is pretty useless when it comes to doing anything. It can't pick up a drink from the fridge and bring it to you, which I would really appreciate right now, but that's impossible. So the key question that I would like to raise is, Yes, we can improve the intelligence of robot with time and effort. The question is, is this gonna be a game of diminishing returns? That means we can put more and more effort into this problem, but we're never actually gonna reach a point where it is an acceptable intelligence. So let me give you an example. I could set myself the goal of jumping to the moon. And I can jump up right now and I'll probably make it like 10, 20 centimeters into the air. And that's it. Well, you say, well, you know, just put more effort into it. You know, just train and, 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 and try again. And then I can do that. I can train, I can jump and I can bicycle and I can get stronger and I can jump again. And I'm probably going to be, get a bit, a little bit higher, right? And I can train years and years and become super strong with my legs. And yes, I can maybe even touch the ceiling of, of my room and I can do that. But still, no matter what I do, I'll never get to the moon. It's never going to happen. So the question that we're really facing with social robots is, will we ever get there? Is it something where no matter how hard we try, we'll never get there? Or is it something that can actually be reached? Because clearly we have made some progress. Yes, we have, you know, robots that can play chess and go, and there is some sort of progress, obviously, but the question is, will this ever be enough? And I think unless we figure this out, um, I think this is an important question to figure out. Maybe we cannot figure it out, but it is really an important question because if it is something that cannot never be reached, then we're wasting our time and we should stop and do something else. Um, now, the shape of this curve also is unknown. You know, maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, predicting the future is always extremely difficult. So how exactly this curve is shaped, probably nobody knows. Um, and again, uh, predicting the future is hard. Um, 
Um, but this is a fundamental question that we are facing. And, and of course, there are workarounds. Uh, so, so, for example, some of the things you can do is you can not actually be intelligent. So you can just fake intelligence, right? Uh, so here's an example that, that we bit, did many, many years ago. Uh, these little robots here, they have, uh, they just do word spotting. And we trained them. Um, one of them has been trained as a library, which is based on the Bible. Another one has been trained on the Quran. And another one has been based on uh, the Hindu books. And these robots then just talk to each other. Turing proposed a test for the intelligence of machines. Already I'm not sure if I can forward this. Despite great efforts, no computer has passed this test so far. Each year, chatbots compete for the Lugner Prize, the first formal instantiation of a Turing test. No contender was able to fool the jury yet. The major problems of the chatbots are the lack of common knowledge and the logical consistency of a dialogue. We explore a new approach to chatbots by focusing on non-logical conversation topics. Mysticism. Uh, the books of the major religions are widely acknowledged examples of mystical topics. We select the New Testament, the Quran, and the Veda as the knowledge base for our conversational robots. The robots are able to autonomously talk to each other and humans about their religious belief. Each robot represents a belief, but does not reveal no, their convictions. This found alone, and they kept it closed and told no man in those days any of those things which they... Well, you get the idea. So what we do here is that we take away the need to be reasonable, functional, and logical by talking about mystical topics, um, and you just respond to each other. And this can all sound very, very smart, um, but of course, the machines don't really know anything they're talking about. So you can fake intelligence. That's definitely possible. You can also exploit human suspension of disbelief. So when we see robots, they automatically think, oh, this is a robot. It can do all sorts of things. And they, they start believing you. Um, so you can ex essentially exploit the weaknesses of, of humans. Um, and of course, one of the things that we do as researchers is we exploit these dreams and ideas to get research funding. Like we make wonderful proposals to our governments to attract funding. And uh, not all of the things that we promise uh, are actually things that we can deliver later on. Another thing that you can do um, to overcome this problem is just the Wizard of Oz. So essentially what you do is you have a robot and you have somebody in the back who remote controls it and the people who interact with the robot have the impression that they're interacting with a really, really smart robot, but they actually really only interact with a human. And we frequently do this kind of deception in our experiments to overcome problems. Like if you have a robot in a shopping mall and you want it to interact with speech recognition, well, speech recognition is not going to work. So you need somebody, in a, a human listener in the back just to recognize the text and press the right buttons. Um, so to some degree, there's a legitimacy to this approach, um, but still um, it is not actually solving the real problem. And one of course is uh, the biggest uh, thing is that you just declare it, it's not a bug, it's a feature. So one way you can do or come around this problem is just uh, select a very specific group for whom this works. So robots have a problem with that there's, it's very, very hard for them to be entertaining in a long term. Um, so if they get very, very quickly, very, very boring, then you just select people who actually appreciate repetition, who appreciate that the robot is always doing the same thing. So you then pick people with, with autism or dementia who really don't care and they actually appreciate this. So you turn this bug and this problem of that we have into a feature. It's actually a good thing that the robot is not smart. It's a good thing that uh, it repeats itself all the time, and that's fine. And um, um, this is a little comic <laughs> I picked up. We believe this resolves all remaining questions on this topic. No further research is, ne is necessary. Uh, is, it, is a text or a sentence that you will never find at the end of any research paper. Um, all of our research paper end with, well, we believe that we need to find more, we have to do more research. Um, so in a way, um, uh, this is another nice little comic strip uh, where I'm a fiction writer in the grand proposal genre. So this is in a way, what is happening is that we talk to our government and our funding bodies and 
we these people have ideas in their mind about robots are and what the future is and 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 again the same with uh, with the bank in bangkok they they believe that this is the future and we we use this to to get money and then hopefully we can actually do some real research with it um but we essentially exploit this belief and for some people this actually works so here we have um somebody who has got some very interesting opinions about uh the yeah, COVID crisis which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. Right. And then I see the disinfectant that knocks it out in a minute. In a minute. And is there a way we can do something like that? Uh, uh, injection inside or, or almost a cleaning. Is it see if it's on the lungs? Yeah. So here we have a. U.S. president who believes that injecting bleach into your body is a solve is a solution for a COVID crisis. So this is how problematic this can become if people have no scientific idea or, or, or understanding and then just go by whatever. Um, but you know we don't have to go this far to to the U.S. Uh, this is now example from Christchurch, my very own little city, and here we have. Arby Well, he started a company called the Terrible Foundation, and they promised to build the biggest, best supercomputer in the Southern Hemisphere. And, and this is what Zach was supposed to do. We're going to remove the people from the equation everywhere that the customer supports. Uh, the machine in charge. So the idea is take the links out of human involved, replace it with the machine, and see what happens. Is it going to be a colossal disaster or a success? <laughs> Find out. We're taking um, away the management team, we're removing the board, we're taking away the accounts people, um, product procurement, um, configuration, provisioning, uh, customer support, social media management, all of it. And we're going to continue to do that. But beyond that, we're not going to watch it, we're not going to stop it, we're going to let it do what it wants and what it sees to be fit, provided you can present us with a reason for why it's doing it. Who wants to tell any people's accounts? Why is it doing it? If it doesn't want to connect to people's accounts, why does it want to? all those sort of things. So there'll be a human oversight, but we're not going to watch it. We made terrible talk one single thing. So here you have it. Zach, the supercomputer, was built to function as the CEO of the company. That is their proposal. And th there are documents available, minutes of meetings, of, of management meeting for, for the Terrible Foundation that show that Zach was talk to as the CEO of the company. And this sounds a bit fantastic, but then we come here, we go to David Whale of the Omega Health uh, organization, and they wanted to use Zach, the supercomputer, in a medical note-taking. And this is a medical doctor now um, that, that believed in this. So we started off to train Zach and were amazed by his ability. In no time at all, we trained him to take notes in SOAP format, that's subjective, what the patient said, objective, what the doctor found, assessment, what the doctor thought the findings meant, and a plan that speaks for itself. So I'm just going to fast forward here. All four of the doctors with whom we compared, and these weren't, you know, inexplicable. So essentially, they did a little bit of a test. They tried Zach versus note taking by professional doctors, and they found that Zach was so much better in note taking than uh, doctors were. And again, imagine there's a supercomputer here that listens to the conversation, makes a transcript, and then even makes summaries and suggestions. Whoa, something happened. Uh, Sorry for that. Uh, I'm screen sharing. That's nice. But where's my presentation? Okay. I hope I'm back. Yes, you're back. And think okay. of the time, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm hurrying up. Um, so um, the catch is that the recordings had to be sent to Zach by email. And it would take a couple of minutes to respond, a day to respond. You never knew renew. And also, Zach was working in this company. You could talk to it as a manager, like uh, so forth. And 
as it happened, it turns out that all of this was just a big scam. Essentially, it was Albi in the background who responded, pretending to be Zach the supercomputer. And this is, again, the danger where you have people believe in something, um, and it's highly problematic. So, and of course, we, with robotics, you have, we've got the Amazon Echo Show now, where you have essentially an animated display that uh, moves around. You don't actually need a robot. You can actually just use, for example, uh, Amazon Echo or, or Alexa, all these kind of things. So the thing that makes robots special that any conversational agent cannot do is touch. That's the one thing that robots can do that nobody else can do, no technical facility. Like it can manipulate the physical world and it can touch you. So we did a little experiment where we asked, or asked the, the, the interesting thing is that you cannot tickle yourself. You need somebody else to tickle you. This is the only way this works. And this is a very important lesson. So for some tasks, robots are key because they are somebody else. And here's a little example of uh, Papiro when it, when it came out. And uh, these are my two beautiful daughters down there. And this was like no experiment. I just popped open the robot, switched it on and filmed it. And this is what happened. So the important lesson here is that the kids came to the conclusion that the most appropriate way of interacting with this robot is kissing it. It's the embodiment. That is what, what, what I mean, it just had some LEDs for the mouth and that, that kind of made them believe that this is the appropriate thing to do. And that is the way the power of robotics is the embodiment. So coming back to this question, uh, what is an acceptable level of intelligence and how can we overcome these problems of the necessary intelligence that we need for this to work? Because if we don't have a necessary intelligence, we will just keep on producing GBOs that will be a nice gimmick, that will be a nice marketing stunt, but they're never really going to get anywhere. And most of all, nobody's going to pay money for it to buy it because it's just not worth it. So if you're interested in this, have a look at my little podcast. We do all sorts of interesting topics on around human-robot interaction. Um, the latest episode is about Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. Uh, we've got some interesting uh, books coming up or uh, already published. And with that, I'd like to thank you and take questions. Thank you very much, Christoph, for this inspiring talk. Now we have some minutes left, roughly 10 minutes to discuss. Uh, so I would like to invite the audience. If you may, you can pose questions to our speaker. You may raise your the blue Zoom hand or uh, you may just start speaking if you might like. Uh, hi. Hey, How are you? I'm fine. Um, awesome. Um, I was just thinking about um, these scams that you talk in, in the presentation. I was wondering um, how these scams are built. Um, is that these scammers read our papers and they rely on the broad conclusions that we present? Uh, that, you know, in the age of our papers, we don't discuss too much about the limitations. Um, as a reviewer, I've always made emphasis that we should uh, present a lot of um, detail in the limitations of our studies. But uh, or, or, I, I was wondering, if, as a researcher, to what extent we have contributed to these um, uh, scams, uh, to what extent our influence is there, or if these people just come up with crazy ideas and they you know, just realize that um, the people who review these this, this scams uh, don't know anything about robots. How, how do you think this comes to you? Maybe to rephrase the question again, because it was hard to hear to many of you, I oh, assume. Um, what do we as researchers in social robotics contribute to the fact that we are maybe disillusioned in, in the sense that we think robots can do more than they actually could? Is that maybe correctly rephrased, Eduardo? Yeah, 
That's correct, Frederica. In, yeah, in our papers, how we, how we present our work, how we address the limitations. And Christoph, what would you have to say in this regard? I think when we publish scientific papers, we're doing pretty good. Um, because if we don't, the peer review process is definitely going to take care of that. So I think on a scientific communication of scientists and scientists, we're doing pretty good. The problem is when scientists communicate with non-scientists, that means the general public, or even more problematic with policymakers, politicians, and funding agencies. This is where it gets problematic. And I recently had an interview with Tony Belpin, and I asked him, well, you know, how, how do you deal with this when you, you know, make funding proposals to the European Union and you promise all sorts of things? He said, not a bit dishonest. And uh, Tony said, well, you know, that's just the game and they're all in on it. Uh, the people who receive this proceeding, uh, these proposals, the people who re review these proposals, they all know that these are all promises and ideas and that this is not necessarily something that you can achieve. And the problem is, if you are in this competition of who's got the craziest idea, uh, you have to kind of get at the right level. If it's too crazy, they will shut you down because it definitely will be, you know, uh, obviously uh, fantastical. But if you pitch a realistic idea, it will not be exciting enough. And then you also don't get the funding. So getting this right level of excitement without overpromising, this is the art that I don't have. <laughs> Further Life questions. Safely, yeah? <laughs> Further questions from the audience. So this is Mohammed speaking. Um, thanks. Very very interesting talk. I I'm really interested in the last part of your talk when you refer to the sense of touch and that what really made. Uh, the robot, a, a very special entity to interact with humans. I wonder if you share uh, your thoughts about this comparison of having a physical robot with all the complications and the difficulties of building realistic interactive robots and having virtual representations of these and, and having some sort of human machine interfaces that can simulate that physical interaction. So what are your thoughts about this? Thank you. Oh, that's a very, very good question. Um, so for a lot of tasks that are about communication only, uh, you don't need to go through the trouble of building a robot. You're probably much better off with a screen-based solution uh, because you don't have to deal with the noisiness uh, of reality. However, if you want to achieve anything in the world, you want to manipulate anything in the world, you want to put an object from A to B if you, or, or anything, then you have no other choice. You have to deal with the noisiness of the world. So, um, and then you have no other choice. So the question is, what is the purpose of the robot? And this is what we're coming back to. What, what is the robot doing? And the functional robots, they actually have a function to do something. They are the ones who succeed in the market. Robots that are only social and the only purpose they have is to communicate and be somehow something. Um, they are the ones that fail in the, mark, in, the, in the market. I mean, not for the market for researchers, because we need them as platforms to do all sorts of experiments, but no consumer is paying for them. I mean, yes, you can get a little bit of a hype and they, maybe they run for a year or two and then they die. So unless it, they have a purpose and a function that is useful to people, I think it's going to be a very hard for robots to be successful in the market. And, and achieving this is really, really hard. Getting a robot to do anything is really, really, really hard. Uh, and that is the main challenge. And uh, it is so easy in science fiction to imagine how we want robots to be. And you can make movies about it and show it to people. And they all share this idea about the wonderful world of the future with robots in it. But nobody understands probably about how incredibly difficult it is to achieve this. And if you say, look, we're going to improve speech recognition by 5%, which is really, really, really hard thing to do, you're not going to get any funding for it because it's not exciting enough. You know, you have to make these wild promises. Um, and I'm, I'm not, it's, I'm not, I don't want to assign blame to anybody here in this, because it's, it's, a, it's a very complex problem here. Um, but I see uh, it as a real problem that 
this idea of a purely social robot, the market has spoken. It doesn't work. Nobody's buying it. Thanks for that rather pessimistic uh, perspective, uh, particularly for researchers like myself working in uh, social robotics, being a social psychologist interested in exactly improving such social robots. Uh, we have only very few minutes left. I, I see there's maybe an, uh, a question in the chat that we could try to answer. Let me check in, Christoph, maybe you could check. Um, it's no, there is none. It's not a. It's just a note. Um, so, since there are some students from UAEU in the audience as well, if you want, please dare and pose a question. That would be your last chance because we're, we're already running a bit over time. Uh, but you could uh, use that chance and uh, get your questions to Professor Bartnick. Well, maybe I can share another story that Tony told me, which is, again, is, is very symptomatic of the situation. Tony was invited by a TV producer to uh, make a TV documentary, and it was called The Robot Will See You Now. And it was about how robots could be used in healthcare, particularly in psychology, where they could be a person or something to talk to, and it could be a therapeutic session. And Tony went on like, okay, let's build such a robot. Let's do speech recognition. Let's do a dialogue management. Let's build all these things. And they put a lot of effort into making it work. But then it wasn't exactly snappy. You know, it took the robot some time to find the right response and it just took time. And the TV people didn't like it. They didn't want this. So eventually they replaced this with a robotic voice and, and it was broadcasted. And it was presented as if the robot was this fluent conversational partner. And the TV show never told anybody that was, this was complete fake. And then people started to call up Tony and asked him, Tony, please, where can I buy this robot? I, I, my, my, my children are suffering from maybe a depression or have other problems. Where can I buy this robot that will help them? And he had to say, I'm sorry, this was a whole fake. I'm very sorry, we don't have such a robot. And here you see this problem where we sell this illusion and, and, and the media wants it because it's a great story to tell, but we're not there. And if we present with what we can do, um, it's not necessarily where we want it to be. No? Why is it not possible to reach to an acceptable level of intelligence? And if it's possible, how long will it take us to reach to that level? Oh, that's a very good question. If I knew the answer, I would be a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, this is the problem of predicting the future. If you know what the problem is, you can try to fix it. But we don't know what we don't know. That is the problem. And so I'm making this bold claim that I think that maybe we'll never get there. Um, and I cannot prove it. Maybe in two years time, there will be a breakthrough in AI and suddenly all of this becomes possible and we reach the singularity. Yeah, that's why it's called the singularity, right? Um, it's been promised for a while. Uh, let's see when it comes. So yeah, this will actually be a good test. For when, we, when will we ever reach singularity? Um, and since this is being recorded, uh, I'll, I'll make you a bet, and I'll maybe I'll put this to the panel. Make a bet when we reach a singularity. I'll pitch the idea, never. And now it's up to you to make a guess. You know, I want to hear from all of you how many years it's going to take. It's always going to be 50 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's N plus 50. Yeah. 